five years ago, I could not have had this conversation with you because talking about it would have made me break down. That selection of 5% of men is something that men have noticed and I noticed and you noticed back then. And in my entire thing was, well, I'm gonna take that as a given and I'm gonna ask the question, what do I have to do to be in that 5%? wanted to chat with you since you've spent so much time with women about what you've learned from women that would be valuable to men since my audience is mostly men. So how much time and what have you been doing in the women's dating world? I've been working with predominantly women in their love lives for 17 years. Mm. I started in London with very small groups of people and I started making YouTube videos at 19, which was you know, going back 17 years now. And that was, I came back six months later to learn to my surprise that people were actually watching them. I wasn't like some story of someone being consistent and like, just, yeah, yeah. I wish I was. I was the same story. Yeah. I would have loved it. If I was consistent, man, it yeah. would have been unbelievable. <laughs> but it, I was not, I wasn't smart enough to like double down on what was working. Mm. <laughs> I just saw, I went, oh, this is yeah. good. It's like people watched them. And then I stopped again for a while. But like I, I would release these videos that were predominantly aimed at women in the beginning, but that, you know, I'm now, my channel has over half a billion views mm. and it's actually a lot more guys watching mm. now, big gay following, big, like, it's just kind of- Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it's, it's much, and actually more and more these days, we're trying to ungender things. Not, you know, we still have programs designed for women. I still have a retreat that is exclusively women every year, but mm -hmm. more and more the front facing kind of content that I'm putting out there, there's so, it's so universal. Yeah. And there's so many guys that enjoy it that there's a part of me that's like, I don't want them to think it's not, like I'm going out of their, my way to make it not for them because mm. it's, if it didn't help them, it would make no sense to me because it's all helped me. Mm. Like everything that I talk about is stuff that at one point or another I have like used or it's benefited me. So I think it's very, very universal. I, uh, I'm reminded, I was going to ask you and I would love to hear about things that you've learned from that, like that men can do. But what I've learned that women can do from watching your stuff is stuff that like girlfriends, when I was not very committed, brought to our relationship. And so uh, I remember watching your videos and realizing that a girl that I had been with had very much, what is it like the sweet and sour thing? Oh, the bliss point. Yeah. That I'm, I'll let you take it, but she did it really well. And I've seen women miss long either way. And yeah, go ahead and tell this one. <laughs> this was this, there's a, there's a food industry term called the bliss point that yeah. describes the optimal level of, you know, salty and sweet that m makes something moreish. Mm -hmm. you know, if you think like kettle corn, you know, or, you know, I don't know, like that peanut butter and jelly thing that the exact right level that makes you just keep wanting more of something mm -hmm. and not really realize you're full. Mm -hmm. um, and I realized like, oh, there's a bliss point to communication. There's a optimal level of like, for want of a better term, like salty and sweet mm. that makes you irresistible and makes someone keep wanting more of you to, you know, I think people get this wrong on both sides. So what, what do you mean by like salty and sweet in this context? Like, I could tell you how she expressed it. In oh, I'd be fascinated to yeah. hear. I, you know, I think, a, for example, you could be a guy and be so sweet that you never have any standards. You don't stick mm -hmm. up for yourself. You really want somebody. So you kind of let them walk all over you. Mm -hmm. And at a certain point, it's like that sweetness has, you know, it's, you've overdone it. It's mm -hmm. become a mutation. Uh, the too salty and it's like, you know, the person who's, you, we all know that person who goes into a dating scenario and they're like, this is what I deserve and this yeah. is what I want and yeah. this is what you have to be for me. And you're mm -hmm. like, but you haven't even made the sale yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, it's no, it's like someone standing outside of a restaurant yelling like, here's how expensive our food is. <laughs> and you haven't, they haven't even like shown you the pictures yet yeah. or made you want the thing. So there's a, you know, the, there's a right, there's like an optimal level of communication where you communicate you know, that you, for example, you may not want to go home with someone yet, but you communicate that you find them sexy mm -hmm. and that like, you know, I have no doubt that would be really fun between us. Mm -hmm. 
I'm, it's just a little fast for me. Yeah. You know, that's a, that's a nice like bliss point thing because it's like, I'm showing you a standard that I don't want to go there yet, but there's no lack of sweetness. Like I'm, I'm still, I'm still giving you all of the elements that make this an exciting conversation, Mm -hmm. not just like a put you in your place conversation that makes you never want to try again because yeah, this like went standard so that's how dare you insinuate or yeah well, who do you think i am yeah, like what yeah. kind of person do you think i am or you know it's like there's i think people miss that a lot where either and i can relate to this you know it's you, you're either being so wanting to please someone in life that you go too far and you end up getting taken advantage of or not coming across as very attractive in the process or, you know, you're putting your foot down or you're learning how to have standards and you kind of, you go a bit too far mm. and you forget that, hey, charm, attraction, warmth, like these things, generosity of spirit, these things matter. Mm. And I think it's a very, I've, I've watched it be a very common thing over the last 17 years that when people adopt standards, when we're not used to calibrating something, in the beginning, it's very common for people to swing too far. And mm. I kind of, I actually think that's part of a natural process of, yeah. you know, if we're not used to standing up for ourselves, and boundaries, yeah. we don't, we don't know, you know, we could, we could pick fights over nothing. We can stand up for ourselves in ways that are abrasive. Mm-hmm. We can not, we're, we're finding our feet. I think I, I, but I don't think anyone should be harsh on themselves about that. Cause I think that's a natural part of like, you have to sometimes st- go over the line to realize like, oh, okay, so it's more in here. It's not Mm -hmm. all the way over here. Yeah. And you, you had, I realized she like used these, like there were several phrases that were right in that pocket of firm boundary communicated without anger or aggression or you have to, or I'm not going to stand for like with that edge. And uh, I think, like you said, naturally over the course of life, you have to develop that. But if you can just crib someone's phrases to start <laughs> things, it can be very helpful. And I and I definitely got a couple of those early early on in the relationship. It's so funny. <laughs> I've I've had more than a couple of guy friends text me being like, "You were the reason that like just something just ended." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is yeah. I remember. I do for the best times. For the best. I I had this like fucking hussy but also i was like what you know what am i gonna do this is not i watched the videos and i was like this is this is appropriate I well think. i think i think that it was a weird life for a while because i think i was the 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 disconnect as well for me at points in my life was i was guilty of the the behaviors that i was mm. warning against and for you know warning women against and you know i didn't you know, I went through long periods of my love life where I really didn't know how to make myself happy. Mm. I was, I was searching and searching in ways that weren't, they hurt me, but a lot of the time they hurt other people more Mm. and left me like no closer to feeling any peace or happiness or satisfaction, just Mm -hmm. not like kind of a bit scary because I was like, I don't know what, I don't know how to be happy in this area of my life. Mm. I remember going, I remember like when I, when I thought about my evolution, I never related to when people were like, are you in a relationship? I always heard that question as being, I always didn't like it partly because some of those times that I was asked, I wasn't in a relationship, but partly I didn't like the insinuation that that was like the barometer of whether I really knew what I was talking about. Mm. But that was also because I was in a time in my life where I didn't necessarily see that as any kind of barometer for my success. Mm-hmm. I, I, you know, when I v- first started out, my big thing that I got known for was helping women create opportunities in their love life. Yeah. And that was, and, and so much of the thinking behind that was also personal to me because I had grown up feeling very shy and introverted and feeling like I was being chosen, but n- not by the people that I really wanted to yeah. go out with and being too shy and lacking the bravery to speak to the people I really do did want to go out with. Mm. And I remember my first encounters with women, I found this almost 
interesting thread of relatability where I was like, oh, in a weird way, so many of the women that I'm hearing from feel like they are getting treated poorly and they want to be treated better and they want to find someone who wants the same things as them. But one of the reasons why they are settling for the wrong behavior and the wrong person is because they're not they're not being proactive about creating options. Mm. So if you're in a state of waiting for something to happen and then someone comes over and makes something happen with you and it's, you know, the majority of the time, the person who does that is going to be the loudest person in the room. Mm -hmm. They're the person that knows how to do that. It's highly unlikely you're the only person they've done that with this week or this mm -hmm. month. It's a, a pattern for them that they're able to waltz over to someone and do something. Yeah, They're meeting a certain kind of guy and then sticking with that guy because when's the next one going to come along? Mm -hmm. They don't know. Yeah, well, if, if like the barrier to entry is this person has to be an initiator in a very like consistent way, there's a survivorship bias of like, well, I'm dating men who are initiators and they operate in their life as initiators. Yeah, and, which... and by the way, when you, you don't necessarily even identify that you're dating an initiator, you just think you're like uh, women would go, I'm just dating a man and yeah. this is what men are like. But mm -hmm. it's a, that's an interesting bias that I think a lot of women have that like, you know, oh, if men like you, they'll approach you. But they're talking about the same 5% of guys all the time. Mm -hmm. Not Probably even smaller with new Gen Z online stuff. I bet you it's shrunk I, from where it was in that, our day. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting observation because it. I don't remember it ever being good for me. Mm -hmm. When like I was, when I was first dating, it was pre-apps mm -hmm. and there wasn't like, that real low barrier to entry of like, you could just fire off messages to everybody. You could, if you were on like, you know, a match.com, but that wasn't like a time where a 21 year old or an 18 year old would <laughs> yeah. be on match.com. Yeah. You just, there wasn't an app that you could just do it with. So there was this, yeah, it, it, I can imagine that it's gotten much, much lower. I actually remember a guy, this was in, and this was going back like six or seven years now, but I remember a guy, I was speaking to in New York once just being like, how on earth, like the, I, to him, the idea that you go out and you talk to someone mm -hmm. was crazy. He was like, yeah, people, I, he was like, people are doing that. And he was on the apps, but that it was unfathomable to him. Mm. The idea of going on a night out and walking over and talking to someone. So yeah, I think that's gotten much, much lower. I'm, I'm sure. But even then I was like, oh, women keep meeting the same 5% of guys. Mm -hmm. They're not meeting, like I was thinking of myself, I was like, most times in my life, I just hang back. Mm -hmm. I'm not walking over. And so I'm not the one that so many people are meeting. And that was my experience of so many of my friends and people I knew. And I couldn't relate to being the carefree guy who just ran over to people and started talking to them. Like that wasn't me at all. So I had to learn for myself that bravery to overcome that deep, what was for me a deep fear of rejection. And then I realized, oh, in a strange way, women are actually going through the exact same thing where they're not creating opportunity for themselves. And so they're left to be chosen instead mm -hmm. of doing the choosing. The this, this difference was that I thought it was my problem that I didn't know how to do that. I was Me like, too. this is my job. Yeah. I'm supposed to know how to do this as a guy and I'm not doing it. That's my deficiency. Whereas the women I was coaching at the time, many of them felt like, no, this is how it's supposed to be. Mm. I, they're supposed to come over to me. I'm supposed to then you know, like it's not, I'm not supposed to be taking charge. If I did, it would be desperate. It would look wrong. It would be, you know, a sign that I'm not being uh, a woman. I'm not being feminine. So like there was almost, when I first started with women, there was an extra barrier to get over in helping them realize there were ways that they could do that without feeling like they'd given up any sense of whatever femininity they wanted to hold on to. Mm.
yeah, it seems like that that selection of 5% of men is something that men have noticed and I noticed and you noticed back then. And in my entire thing was, well, I'm going to take that as a given and I'm going to ask the question, what do I have to do to be in that 5%, which mm -hmm. is I'm going to have to confront my fear of rejection. I'm going to have to get used to going up and talking to women. So I'm curious. I mean, it's almost like you are doing helpful work for men <laughs> in teaching women to create opportunity yeah. and expand it from maybe 5% of men to like, okay, now there's some women that are going out there and creating invitation opportunities. Exactly. Now, instead of, you know, for the men who don't want to wait on you to touch every woman in the world, metaphorically speaking, <laughs> <laughs> What like what advice, if any, do we have? Is it still it seems fundamentally important that you do accept that at some level that's where our culture and we've been conditioned to a degree and perhaps there's a biological aspect of it as well, that men do find ways to join that initiating cohort. But I'm, I'm curious if you have any other thoughts on that. I think. Look, what what is hard about initiating is that it often goes wrong that it can be painful when it goes wrong mm -hmm. people do people can give you strange reactions and they can give you you know extremely cold reactions and you know i i always remember because i was I, at the time when i was helping women i was also coming out of having worked with guys yeah. for a couple of years. And so I was well aware of what happens when guys try to initiate, Yeah, you know, not just for me, but for other guys too. And it's, and it's, and it can be rough and it can make you feel like, even if you've got things going, this was the weird thing is like, you can have things going on in your life. You know, that you're a good person. You know, that you have a normal, regular life. And then for a moment you feel like, you just knocked on a stranger's door in the middle of nowhere and tried to sell them an ironing board. <laughs> Get the hell out and they're here. like, what the f <laughs> are you doing here? <laughs> yeah. Get out of here. Yeah. You know, and it's like, but wait, no, you, I have a life. And I'm mm -hmm. like, you know, I'm all right. Yeah, I'm not I'm, usually this awkward. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> and it's like and, and my I, most awkward moment probably this month. <laughs> exactly. And I think we get disproportionately kind of penalized for our awkwardness in what is an inherently difficult situation mm -hmm. that we're not going over to someone and asking for the time it's much easier not to be awkward when you're asking for the time yeah but that was how i started myself and with other people was like there is this baseline fear of social encounter for some people that asking for the time is weird so let's just start with asking random things like what's a good restaurant to go to around here? What's a bar that would be fun to check out tonight? And see if with someone that you're not even attracted to, a guy or it could be, you know, anyone of any age, how what what are the feelings of social discomfort that come up in that conversation and start there and ramp up to like the Uber experience of rejection, which is someone I'm attracted to when I'm making my interest in them more directly clear. Yeah. That's so interesting. Cause I I had the, I used to take people through an exercise where I would get them to go and ask for the time mm -hmm. and then like almost like ramp up in very tiny yeah. layers from mm -hmm. there. So it'd be like asking for the time and then, um, you know, giving them a compliment after asking mm -hmm. for the time and then adding one more layer on top of that. And <laughs> it would be, I would even like, I remember when I first started out, I would sometimes give some, I would give a guy a mission where I would be like, I would say, no, we'll, I would like be like, we're leaving now. So you have to do one more thing, but you're not allowed to get this person's number. It's not allowed mm -hmm. to go anywhere. I just want you to pay a very authentic compliment to this person mm. and start by saying, Hey, me and my friends are leaving before we leave. I just wanted to tell you this. And give them a very authentic compliment. Mm -hmm. But by the way, nothing can happen from it. So don't worry about it. And it was so interesting. Like that when I gave them permission to stop thinking that even when I forbade them from getting something. Yeah, I was like, you're yeah. not allowed. Yeah. Nothing's allowed to happen here. Yeah, I don't want to, yeah. you don't, can't come and tell me that you got someone's number or that it went somewhere. Mm -hmm. you, I literally just want you to give an authentic compliment and then we're going. Yeah. The confidence that people then felt when they were relieved from the pressure of the intention of it was really profound 
I love that. And, and so, and I realized, God, how much of my own fear just always came from this, this expectation that I just carried with me on a deep level into every situation mm -hmm. that robbed me of my authenticity, robbed me of my generosity of spirit, just turned me into this person that was terrified they weren't going to get the thing that they were trying to get, which was inherently a difficult thing in the first place, mm -hmm. to go over to someone who doesn't know you and to try to conjure something out of nowhere and to, you know, ask for their details and to like, oh my God, so yeah. many levels of scary. And I, I kind of, and it's no different. Like even in my life now, I have to catch myself when I'm connecting with someone mm -hmm. in business and go, am I, what's behind, what am I trying to do here? Like what's behind this? Am I messaging this person right now on Instagram because I want to connect with them? Mm. Or am I doing it because like deep down, I just really want to get this thing and I really yeah. need this from them. <laughs> you know, I, I love this. I've been asking myself, and even now I can, why am I interrupting now? Oh, I need to feel like I'm contributing. <laughs> you know, like I'm en like there's yeah, this yeah. endless yeah. conversation about getting and proving. I love that exercise because you're like, I'm going to strip your ability to do mm. that artificially just for a minute. And all of a sudden I'm imagining all the ways that my brain would go, which is I can't get her number. I, I have to find, and then, now I'm looking around the room for what I authentically find like, I'm not trying to get your beauty or get your validation. And now I'm looking at the room for like what I really just admire. Like whose fashion yeah. sense do I like? Or, or, and like now the room looks totally different when I'm not trying to get something from yeah. it. Yeah. I love that. Profound. Yeah. And, 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 and I think we can catch ourselves with that all through, all through life because it's the same thing that does hold us back professionally is people can just sense you just did a thing here to get this thing here, not because it's who you are or mm. not because there was anything authentic about it. It, it's me and my wife went to Japan for a month last year and we just were essentially, we did a little bit of travel, but for the yeah. most part we were just kind of living in Tokyo. Like we were just like, we just want to be here. And, and one of the things that was like the most beautiful was that there's just zero tipping culture mm. in Japan. Not only is it not encouraged, it's like they wouldn't know what to do if you gave it to them. They'd be like, no, like it's, no, it just yeah. it doesn't compute. And it did this wonderful thing that it was like very subtle, but over the course of that month, I was able to interpret everything anyone was doing as much more authentic because mm -hmm. when we were in a restaurant or a coffee shop or anywhere and someone was just having a conversation with us or being nice to us it wasn't tinged with and the bill's coming mm. and there's going to be a smiley face on the <laughs> bill <laughs> that says thank you so much yeah yeah even though like for the first half hour of me sitting here you weren't that nice but now that the bill's coming all of a sudden it's like the smiley face and that you know it just in in the in america uh, you know, it, it was this weird thing where I, I, it made me sad because I realized like we, we live in Los Angeles and I thought, God, how many interactions do I not take as seriously as I could or should? Mm. Because they're always tinged with this agenda. Yeah. And when the agenda was taken away, I got to experience someone as a person again. Mm. And I think there is something Look, it's hard when it comes to our love life because there is there is an agenda we have. We want to find love. And it and for some people, they want to have sex. Like it's mm -hmm. a, whatever it is, there is an agenda there. Mm -hmm. And that unfortunately, that agenda when we're trying to meet a need for ourselves, yeah. it can have the tendency of like turning us into another version of ourselves constantly at the very time when what we really need to be able to do is connect mm. with another person. And now they're getting this, 
this other side to us. So it's a challenge. It's not, it's not an easy thing mm -hmm. to overcome, but I think one of the ways to overcome it is to, is to kind of decide a standard for ourselves for the way we want to operate in general mm. that isn't, there isn't some giant chasm between that standard and who we feel we need to be in the moments where we actually find someone attractive. Yeah. Because that's a really hard gear switch to make is that now I suddenly think someone's attractive over there. Now I'm going to be nice. Yeah. When you were in the last hour of being in this place, there wasn't that natural like kindness to you or there wasn't that openness yeah. to you. And that's not to say you have to be having conversations with people all day, every day in anticipation of the one that time. That was how I handled it. I called it flirting with the world. I was like, I can't turn it on. This was the whole thing of with like, turn it on to charisma on command was that's really hard to do. What is much easier is to find a sustainable gear that you can live in and the joy and the Beautiful. interaction of that. And gosh, when you're like talking to that guy and this guy and this old man, and then holy cow, there's someone here that I'm attracted to. It's like the room is already warmed up. She's already seen it. Yep. It's already versus I've been standing here quietly. I don't know any of these people, even though I come to this coffee shop every day and now she's here. That is mm. awkward and uncomfortable and strange. So that that just like flirt with the world like that that was that, no that's <laughs> really piece. good and i think that i i i operated in a similar way because mm -hmm. it wasn't even from the point of view of being an introvert it was hard to get warmed up mm -hmm. in general so like it to to this day me and audrey went to a party last night dude I, it like was in danger of ruining my day. Mm. <laughs> Thanks for coming here. <laughs> no, but this is easy for me. Like I know we're going to hang out today and it's mm -hmm. just like close circle and it's, it, yeah. that's easy to me. Like that feels be hanging with you because we've now hung a bunch of times. It's, it's like, it's like home. It's like, oh, it's, it's just chill. It's easy. Mm. But going to a party and like, I don't know a lot of people and it's going to be a lot of small talk and it's going to be a lot of like frivolous, like bouncing around. Yeah, and yeah. that is like anxiety to me still to this day. And I'm that I have tools. So that's, what's great about it. And I think that's why I encourage people. It's not over the course of your lifetime, you're probably not going to fundamentally change your nature or who you are, but you, you get these tools and the tools become life-saving. I love this. That's the thing that changes you. Yeah. So, so you're an introvert. I consider myself an introvert. I worked really hard to like bust out of that and behave extrovertedly. And I think very few people are going to do that. So whether you're working with women or men, you find someone that like finds these places where people often meet one another to be really challenging and difficult. Do you have, uh, workarounds mm -hmm. or yeah like how, yeah. how how should an introvert handle that i think firstly from the from a um this so there's so there's internal workarounds and and some nice external workarounds the, mm -hmm. a key internal one that i've always found immensely helpful is that when i am so there's there's introversion and there's shyness right mm -hmm. and they're not the same thing necessarily mm -hmm. they, they can overlap but I realized my introversion is not a problem, right? It's a kind of superpower that I have. My shyness can be a problem. And I need to work on my, I don't need to work on my introversion. I need to work on my shyness and the anxiety that sometimes accompanies my introversion. Can you distinguish between the two? Well, I think introversion is a kind of natural it's like, where do we find our homeostasis? Like, where do we find our natural state that we recharge, that we feel comfortable? And for me, you know, I, for sure, I, my own company or the company of very close people in my life is where I recharge. And even then it's not like I go when I, when I talk, that's like, F, that's energy. Mm. 
And then I retreat and I'm like, I need to not talk. Got it. And my, my wife is, you know, even for her, like we'll go out to dinner and the way I relax is by not talking. And the way she relaxes is by talking, which sometimes <laughs> creates like, you know, she's like, is something, are you mad at me? Why aren't you talking to me? And I'm like, no, 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 I'm not mad at all. I just yeah. like, this is, you know, so I, but, but that's not why on the way to a party, I have this hum of anxiety. You know, I think that that's, mm. there's still like a sense Got of oh, something about this after like, you know, put myself out there and there's still something about a crowded room that just makes me feel a little bit uneasy and just, you know, I, but whenever I'm in that state to an unhealthy degree, it tends to be because I've forgotten everything I know about people. Mm -hmm. I have started to other people again and think that they're like a different species and I have to go and talk to them. But what I realized was other people are also coming to this party with their stuff. Yep. Baggage, insecurity. Do I know enough people? Is my friend going to walk away and I'm going to be stuck with someone I don't know? What do I say? How do I come across as cool? How do I, yep. you know, fake that I'm higher status than I am at this party? Whatever it is, like everyone's got their thing. And I, I realized that there is something inherently, mm, this was a, I'm not saying this is always true, but it was a helpful way for me to think about it. And I think there is some truth to it. I realized there was something inherently selfish about my shyness. Mm. Shyness was all about me. Yeah. How I'm feeling, I'm anxious. What if I get rejected? What if I say something embarrassing? What if I say something awkward? I don't know what to say. I don't, it's all about me and how I'm going to come across. Yeah. But other people in that room also, they're not unlike me. They want to feel at home mm -hmm. in this room that we're both in. And when I'm being shy, I'm not being generous. If I want to perceive myself as a kind and generous person, well, be the kind and generous thing to do in a room is to give energy mm -hmm. in a way that makes other people feel more at home. Mm -hmm. My shyness doesn't make other people feel more at home. It makes them feel even more alienated. They probably misread my shyness as coldness. <laughs> yeah. They or that I, like me. I think yeah. I'm too good for them or yeah. I don't like them or I don't want to try, whatever. At the very least, it keeps me as a stranger. So I started saying, if I really believe I'm a generous person, I will get over myself in this moment and I'll go make someone else feel at home. Mm. And that, that was a big internal shift for me that allowed me to put my energy outwards and focus on the feelings of other people, not my own, which is where my shyness took hold. The external thing, I'll give you one thing that for me was really helpful. And it actually relates to your flirt with the world concept. But I used to, I used to teach this a long time ago, this idea of what I called, I could never come up with a better name for it, but there's definitely a better name for it somewhere that someone will come up with. But I used to call it two hit theory. And the idea was that when you go into a room, you probably came alone or with one or two people max. Everyone else also either came alone or with one or two people max. So over the course of the evening or a day or whatever the event is, we all want to gradually feel more at home. Mm -hmm. right? We all hope that we'll leave feeling more comfortable than how we felt when we walked in. So what if instead of like looking at your interactions as this like you have to go in like an assassin and like make an impact and get some kind of result there and then, which puts pressure, raises the stakes, makes you feel nervous. What if instead you went in and you said, I'm just going to have these very light touch moments with people, whether it's the person who just sat me down, whether it's the person serving me my coffee, where mm -hmm. I, I say more than is customary, just like yep. one more sentence. Or the person next to me at the bar where I say, what is it you're drinking? That looks good. Oh, cheers. Mm -hmm. Like a, just a, 
just a moment. Like you're not trying to get anything out of it. You're not trying to stay there and have a conversation. You're not turning to meet the person. You're just having a quick light touch moment. But you have as many as you can. Mm -hmm. And you have them with anyone who's in close proximity. The fact that you don't need it to go anywhere and you're not trying to make it go anywhere allows you to do that with confidence and without the fear of the stakes being high. But the idea was this. If everyone came with one or two people, the person that had the light touch interaction with them an hour ago mm -hmm. is by definition, their third best friend <laughs> in the room. Yeah, yeah. And if you're the third best friend in the room to 10 different people, then over the course of that event, you are going to be the person that those 10 people at some point or another hey. close in on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you're gonna, you've basically started the day or the evening by making yourself the most approachable person in that room, which by the way, is gonna make other people brave. I think it's a wonderful lesson in life. Go through life being the person that makes other people brave. Because mm. if you're that person, you're gonna have so many more interactions that are actually done for you because of the way you initially made someone feel. And that two hit theory is all about, the first hit is what you do when you go into the room and for that first hour or that thir first 30 minutes. The second hit is what happens over the next four hours mm. because of the way that you planted all those little seeds yeah. early on. We called it planting seeds. That was literally- You did? Yeah. Oh, hilarious. <laughs> we, we've had this joke before where it's like you and I in some way have led these very parallel lives just in different- Yeah. Yeah, it's very it's, fascinating. I just, just to tag on, that is especially powerful and compounds in closed social, closed social circles where there's a, re there's a repeating aspect. So like a coffee shop or a university or a conference that's four days long. like. Yes. That's cool for a night at a bar, but if you do that in your gym or your whatever, it's incredible. Like these, these nothing interactions, just then you put a week between it and you come back, you're friends now. It's so, it's, it's incredible how, it how those small things compound. That's exactly right. And it, it requires having a little bit more of a zoomed out mm -hmm. view of interactions and connections and mm -hmm. taking a slightly longer perspective yeah on them than needing to go in and make something happen yeah. yeah yeah love that um so i want to take it back to uh the audience in this case and i'm imagining so we've talked a little bit about um well i want i want to go back if there's anything in particular that that is coming to you that you have learned as you've like spent so much time with women that men don't recognize or don't know uh, that would be helpful to them in dating? I think certainty on some level mm. is a really valuable trait to have. Yeah. And we, I think as men, we tr often try to find certainty in places that are precarious mm. and can... Um, we we can spend a whole life trying to gain certainty in ways that either we never really achieve like money and status or sometimes looks um or our body and the, how big and strong we get and we you know we look for certainty in these places or even honestly, even if you attain certainty in those places, the problem is there's always someone with more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, if the if you now are basing the person you've got and the attraction they feel for you and how secure you are with that person on where you are in all of those ways, and then a presence comes into the room that is better looking or taller or has more money or has a bigger business, it's you you immediately rocked. Mm. So I think that certainty is really important to women. Where that certainty comes from is where all your leverage is in yourself, in, in, in the power that you have for yourself. And I I feel like I've spent my life trying to 
adjust where I get my certainty to try to make that more and more bulletproof mm. because that if we place our certainty in the wrong things, it, there's a, there's a, if the dictionary definition of confidence is or at least one of them, there's a couple, but one of them is the state of feeling certain about something. And that's interesting because there's like a, something sort of unemotional about that. Mm -hmm. It's a bit agnostic. It's like, it's not saying confidence is good or bad. It's just saying it's a feeling of certainty about yeah. something. And then you have to ask, well, where do I get my certainty from? Because if that's something that's bulletproof or if it comes from something that's kind of untouchable, then I'll always have confidence. Mm -hmm. If it comes from something brittle that can go away or that can be met by a stronger presence, then immediately I'm going to feel insecure. I'm going to feel like I'm not good enough. I'm going to get jealous of that person or I'm going to feel this person is a threat. So I, I, and I learned, I remember <laughs> like in silly ways, learning how powerful certainty was. I remember being at school in a time where my family had gone broke and was living in a trailer. And we had been moved, like we had a house, that house was long gone. My dad had a plot of land and no money to actually finish building a house on it. So we put a trailer on it. And then me and my two brothers and my mum and dad lived in this trailer. And I remember around that time going into school and like talking about where I was going to be like, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And I'm going to, and I, there was an energy about me. Mm -hmm. There was an energy about me that was different. And there was a, a girl that I had never really paid any attention to me. And she was like one of the girls at school that like had a lot of people's attention and, and she came in one day and she said, my mum wants me to marry you. <laughs> and I said, why? And she said, well, because she thinks you're going to be some, like, she thinks you're like. Well, driven. <laughs> be someone. And I remember it was this weird thing for me where I went, never has, like, my actual position right now is horrible. Like, we, if I had a girlfriend, we, I would bring her home to this trailer. Mm -hmm. But the perception of me is, it wasn't like, I wasn't faking it and saying I had all these things I didn't. All I was doing was just talking about with a different level of intensity about where I want to be. And just that had caught someone's attention. Yeah. And I, it was a, it was a weird moment for me because I realized, oh, I, I shouldn't place too much stock in this idea of what do I have compared to other people that just energy, the energy you have, the energy you speak with is a very powerful thing. And I, of course, as I would become an adult, I would learn more subtle ways of mm. doing that than the, like, I'm going to fight the world and show everybody energy. That's because where it starts. I think, I think it starts there. Yeah. And I think the older you get, the more that dates mm -hmm. and you need to like find it from a kind of more mature, sure. Evolved place. But where, but, where is that place? I'm so curious. Cause I've, I've got my own terminology for all of this, but I've, yeah. I've spent a lot of time thinking about this topic as well. I mean, I, someone who always comes to mind for me is like Eckhart yeah. Tolle, because he's not by like you, you don't go, oh, if only I was as tall as Eckhart. Yeah. If only I was as handsome as Eckhart. If only I was as, you know, like wildly charismatic as, as Eckhart. Because he doesn't, he doesn't tick any of the normal boxes yeah. of, he's not, with Tony Robbins, it's easy to feel like you're just never going to get there. Because mm -hmm. he's so outwardly charismatic and he's so tall <laughs> and he's <laughs> so like just, manly yeah. and his voice and his this and his that and he's like so wildly successful and so on every level it's like you sort of feel like you're imitating something you'll never be yeah whereas with Eckhart you look at him and you just go he's so powerful mm. and yet he has none of the things that I would think I need in order to be that powerful 
And I feel like I've gone straight from one extreme to the other here because Eckhart, for me at least, seems to be this very enlightened person. And he's, of all the people out there, he seems to be one of the most genuinely enlightened people to me. And... And so there's in in its own way, there's something that unatt- feels unattainable about that. But I, I think our character and having a true sense of what's important to me in life, what kind of person do I want to be in this life? What energy do I want to put out there? What is my generosity of spirit that I give mm. to other people? Um, I hope it doesn't sound too abstract, but I, I do look at those things and I think there's a, you can place certainty in what you're willing to bring to the world. And you can also place certainty in your standards. You you know, you can't go into everything in life going, I'm going to trust everybody because it's, there's plenty of people that you can't trust, right? So you don't just distribute endless amounts of trust in every direction. And by the way, trying to feel confident that you can trust someone, (laughs) it's again, you're placing your sense of certainty in something you cannot find certainty in. Because you, you don't know. What you can trust in though, where you can find some certainty is, what do I do next if I discover someone is untrustworthy? I used to, uh, find it very hard to trust people and it would have i believe for many years it really affected me in business because i would always be and for reasons in my own life but i always felt like i was going to get taken advantage of mm-hmm. and that made it really hard for me to build real connections with people because I never really gave enough to build the relationship. I was very like, "Eh, let me feel this out. I'm going to be guarded and I'm going to, and it just didn't, so many of the people that I have in my life today have entered my life through a completely different way of being on my side. Mm. That there's a upfront generosity and a willingness to, let my guard down and a willingness to support people. And, and none of that is because like, I trust people a thousand times more today. I do trust people more today. That's true. But I'm also aware that sometimes that will, I'll do that with people that do take more than they give. Yeah. But I have a different level of, of trust in myself that I'll be all right. If, if that happens, a I trust myself not to hold on to it forever and to use it as like a reason to be bitter. But I also trust myself to um, set a boundary where I say, oh, okay, well, that's this is not the kind of person I want in my life. I can draw a line, I can set a boundary, and I can keep moving and applying energy in the right direction towards the right people. So that's like a sense of certainty that's just coming from a different place. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's been a big change for me. And I think also it's been a big change for me is just realizing more and more I look at people in my life who whose confidence I really admire. And it has it just has nothing to do with the things that I originally thought I had to obtain to feel confident. Mm-hmm. It's because it's a very easy thing to be like. Well, how easy to feel confident once you've already achieved a certain amount or once you've already done certain things. And I, I, I sympathize with that argument, but I'm not, I've got people in my own family who have this incredible natural, like contentment and level of confidence who don't have any of the same things that I do. And those become like the rock stars in my life, psychologically, mentally, where I'm like, oh, I want to move closer to that. It's understanding what's behind that. Oh, they've rooted their value in something different. Yeah. Like, what is that thing? And I, 
I think if we can start to like look away from the shinier people that we worry we don't have the same thing they do and start to realize that's not that's not it 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 poses as it so like we follow all these people online and mm -hmm. you know this concentration of people that live in certain <laughs> pockets of the world los angeles being one of them where it's like how many people living in Los Angeles are responsible for like this tiny handful of people exporting 80% of the wisdom <laughs> the culture yeah, and the like ways of being this and that and confident and successful and whatever. And they like the people that are the most diseased in terms of <laughs> like what led them there. Yeah. Like what I see just so many people I, and I'm not, that's, I'm counting myself among this of like i agree i, I think people running. can only share their coping mechanisms that's all that you can do is is this yeah. is how i cope <laughs> yeah and you and you you know i didn't become successful because i was so confident i became successful because i was so insecure mm -hmm. like it's not i don't see that as like this badge of honor i see it as God, I was running a lot faster than other more confident people in my life. Mm -hmm. Other people who were more content. Uh, other people who didn't feel the need to nearly kill themselves trying to be feel significant. Mm -hmm. And so I then end up, the irony is I end up looking back towards the people in life that we don't spotlight nearly as much because there's a sense of certainty about those people that I, th that I find wildly attractive. And that to me is like, that's where it's at. Mm. So I would encourage people to like, look, look for the people who have found this sense of certainty that isn't predicated on any of the things that you've told yourself certainty needs to be predicated on. Yeah. And then investigate that. Mm -hmm. Go, what is going on? with that because i know with the dude who's got money and looks and this and i like i know where their certainty could be coming from and there's a big difference between like one of the things i talk about in my book is the three layers of confidence surface how we come across the identity level is the middle level i'll come onto it in a second and the core mm. now the core is if the surface is how we come across the core is like the deepest deepest level of confidence that relates to our relationship with ourselves but in the middle is the identity level. And the so I heard a lot of, in, in sort of what you were talking about, these rich people or these people with big muscles or these, yeah. Yeah, because it's like, it, it, everyone can imagine that your confidence is, imagine on the identity level, there's a square, a big square in your life or a, a big square that represents your life. And inside that square are lots of smaller squares. And each one of those squares represents a different source of confidence in your life. So it could be the house you live in, it could be the friends you have, it could be your connections, it could be how many books you've read mm -hmm. and how smart you feel for having read those books. It could be the fact that you play guitar really well or that you know two languages or that you have a really highly trained body, but you have these different sources of confidence. Of course, our I call it the identity matrix. Our matrix isn't uniform squares. There's certain squares that we disproportionately derive confidence from and of course the danger of that is the biggest square you have becomes your biggest vulnerability if you derive all your confidence from this hot person you're dating and then they break up with you it's not just the the death of a relationship it feels like the death of your soul it feels like the death you, of your identity you know these squares based on where your anxieties lie and if you're not familiar with the feeling of anxiety it's the thing that you're thinking about all the time and that you're you know if you're getting a lot of excitement to show off your girlfriend to your friends or nervousness that your girlfriend's going like that is a big square in your identity box exactly and you can ask yourself what if you want to know what your biggest square is ask yourself what if i lost it would do the most damage to mm -hmm. my confidence. And that's a, it's a good question to ask because it shows us where we're not diversified enough. By the way, in mindfulness circles, they would be quick to point out that Any the, identity. <laughs> the identity level is a problem, it, full stop. Like yeah. it's not. But I love, I love the stages though. And, and like, 
you could go full on Eckhart for this entire conversation. We would have a totally different conversation about dating in it. But there's such value to like, look, start by using this line, you know, uh, the bliss point line. <laughs> okay, move, surface, surface, yeah. move to a, an identity and try to diversify that identity so that it's a bit more stable and not going to be taken out in one fell swoop in a breakup. This, this matches my own journey. And then dissolve the identities, you know, yeah. as it goes on and and where does it it's it's a really interesting question of well where does your certainty come from now and all of a sudden it's it's increasingly looking like it's in like there isn't certainty <laughs> no but but what is like when i talk about the core where it ends up and this is kind of in a sense spoiling the punchline of the book but people can go and read it because mm-hmm. it's there's entire sections on this and, and it's worth repeating in your mind a thousand times is I I always was trying to figure out like people would when I heard when I looked at the core I said well what does the world tell me the core is all about and it, the aphorism was constantly like love yourself you have mm-hmm. to love yourself and I just could, I could never really connect to that idea because for me it was always yes love myself but also how great are my results and how special do I feel and like I if my results weren't good or if I didn't feel special because I felt like I'd screwed up a lot or I'd made a bunch of mistakes or I, you know, was questioning my value, then I didn't feel special. And if Mm -hmm. I didn't feel special, I had a really hard time loving myself. I just, I couldn't, I couldn't latch onto it. And I knew early on, like, oh, I need a more robust model for this because that model is not working for me. And when I would ask people, I would ask audiences, look, how important is it to love yourself? And I knew the answer. Everyone, yeah, it's so important to love yourself. When I asked them, why should you love yourself? That's when people really struggled. Mm. Because it was like they'd been taught the lesson, but not the why or, or even the how. And people would start, like after a couple of seconds of silence, people would give like, you know, they would give another, like they just replace one platitude with another. They'd be like, well, well, because I'm special. And I'd be like, but why? On what basis are you special? There's 8 billion of us. Mm. And by the way, within those 8 billion, there's a lot of ways we feel we don't match up. So on what basis are we saying we're special? Oh, well, I, yeah, I'm, and then people would start searching for almost like a, uh, like what felt like depth but to me was just another trap because they'd say I'm special because I'm kind and because mm. I give a lot and because yeah. I'm good to my family and because I work really hard. And because all of that to me, again, it's certainly deeper than I'm special because I drive a, get a great car, mm-hmm. but it still opened you. It was still vulnerable because, well, what do you do on the days where you, you're not kind? Mm-hmm. Or to the parts of you that don't want to be kind. Yeah. 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 Like, cause that for me, I was like, for so much of my life, it was, I felt like, I think, I, am I a bad person? Maybe I'm a bad person. Maybe I, like, I would, str- I would like worry. Mm-hmm. Maybe I'm not good. Maybe I'm like, and then every time I do something that was selfish or I said a mean thing or I'm acted like, I would be like, I think I am a bad person. Like I just get stuck in that. Yeah. And so when you tell yourself you're special because of these qualities, and that's why you deserve love, when you're not those qualities, you think you're undeserving mm-hmm. of love. In fact, you think worse. You think you're detestable and disgusting and pathetic and ugly and unlovable. Or, by the way, even on the positive end of, positive end of the spectrum, when you are being those things and you're validating yourself, telling yourself you're worthy of love because of those things, then when you meet someone who's more of them, you're, what are you going to say? They're more lovable? Mm-hmm. You're, you should love yourself, but not as much as that person should mm-hmm. love themselves. It, you're just straight back into comparison. So I started looking at it like, oh, this is almost a, a romantic model for loving ourselves. Like we're trying to apply the way we fall in love with the world, with the way we love ourselves. Mm-hmm. We fall in love with another person because of a combination of, of qualities they have that we find really attractive and a sense of mystery that like I, there's space between us. And that if I can close down that space, 
that, you know, there's something exciting about that. And then I start, that's what falling in love is, right? I close down the space between us and the mystery and I mm. make the mine and I feel, but if you then follow the trajectory of that, what happens, you know, the classic line, familiarity breeds contempt in a long-term relationship, anyone can be in danger of that line becoming true for them. The closer you get to someone, the more you're no longer impressed by all their good qualities. They're no longer a mystery to you. You're more aware of their faults, their flaws, their insecurities, the parts of them that are take, you know, more effort to love and the complexities and, and you might get bored, mm. but you're also aware of all their mistakes and the little, so over time, contempt can become the dominant emotion, which is why so many people break up. Yeah. Well, if that's true, if familiarity breeds contempt, who would you have more contempt for <laughs> than the person you've spent every second of your life with? Mm. And, and that's why the romantic model for loving ourselves is so broken because we're trying to fall in love with ourselves when most of us can barely get to the point of liking ourselves, let alone loving ourselves. So I, what I started to do is look for a very different model altogether for loving myself. And the, the model I originally found it in was the parent-child relationship. Because if you ask a parent, why do you love your child? Yeah. They don't reel off a list of attributes. Hopefully not, right? No, some <laughs> might, some might. And by the way, that's why they're, that it's child is going to grow up with a whole bunch yeah, of insecurities yeah. and, and not feel certain. Mm -hmm. But most parents won't. Most parents will look at you like it's a strange question in the first place. Because you say, why do you love your child? They'll be like, what are you talking about? Because they're my child. Mm -hmm. She's mine. He's mine. What do you? What do you mean? It's my kid. It's, an, it's, like a bro, it's like a weird question. And I love that because it's mine. It's like, mine. Why, do I, why do I love my hurt, my pain, my inadequacies? It's like, because they're mine. Yeah. And that's the thing. Like when I started to look at self-love through that lens, I went, oh, it's, kind, it's, it's like someone at the beginning of my life, and anyone can think this way, gave me a human. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't matter whether you think that's nature or God, or it doesn't matter your belief system. It's like, you got a human. You're one of the lucky ones who got a human. And it's like someone said to you, you just have one job. You're going to take on lots of jobs voluntarily mm -hmm. in your life. You may choose to get married. You may choose to have kids. You may choose to, you know, work an important job. But the one job you're always going to have is that you have to give this human the best life you can. Mm. How you choose to do that is up to you. But your job is to take care of this human. That one change for me changed everything mm. because it, it's irrelevant. Comparison with other people or worrying about what you don't have, or it becomes utterly irre irrelevant through that lens. It would only be relevant if you could exchange your human for a different human, <laughs> right? If like halfway through you got to say, okay, I'll trade, but you don't get to trade. Mm -hmm. You just, you're lucky enough, by the way, most sperm never became anything in the history of time. But if we're here, then we're lucky enough that we actually got a human. Mm -hmm. Your only job, like you're playing a video game, your only job is to figure out how to have the best time with this human, how to give this human the best life, the, the biggest adventure you can, however you want to frame it. And it, it just dissolves in security when you mm -hmm. think like that. It completely dissolves it because you just go, what, 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 who cares if... I, my nose is too big or I don't have enough hair mm -hmm. or if I don't feel too, it's, it's so irrelevant through that lens. It, the only job is just what would I do today if I was trying to give this human the best life I could? Yeah. How would I play the game if yeah. that was and my then, job? And then love just, you know, all of the answers come from that place of- All of the yeah. answers come from that place. So it's kind of like if you- wanted what I feel is like the deepest level of certainty that I arrive at. It's just the certainty that no matter what happens, the answer for myself is always the same. What would I do 
if I was giving the best life possible to this human. Mm. And that may involve in the same way that with a parent and a child, a parent, if a parent's trying to give their child the best life, they won't always give the child what they want in the moment. Mm -hmm. They'll give them what's going to give them the best life. Boundaries and discipline and, and yeah. Exactly. I, you know, it's like if you've been hurt in relationships or if you've been hurt, you know, because you trusted the wrong person or if you, you, you may then from that point on in your life go, I never want to try again or screw this. I'm out. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't want to put myself up for that. Or, but if you said, well, part of what's going to give this human the best life possible is to experience genuine connection is to experience love or friendship or romantic, whatever you say. I can't allow this human to give in to these urges, mm -hmm. to close themselves off or to play defense for the rest of their life. Yeah. If I'm loving this human, it's not about like making this human avoid rejection. It's about putting them out there and making sure that anything could happen to them. Like all these great things, I'm creating an environment. I can't make them happen. But I'm sure as hell, if I'm trying to give this human the best life, going to create an environment where these things could happen. Mm -hmm. You no longer need like confidence in the sense of the word that other people talk about it. And nothing needs to happen outside. Yeah. When you're thinking that way. Mm -hmm. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Self-love for the win. I would love to stay on this topic, but we have to point down. <laughs> um, let yeah. us know a little bit about the book. Well, and I, to talk about the book, I think it, that's a good jump off just because I know when people typically hear self-love, you either are like, yay, self-love, and you aren't someone who's ever thought that deeply about it. You just like the Instagram bumper sticker version of it, or you're someone who rolls their eyes and is like, oh my God, are we really going to talk about self-love? I find this stuff so unhelpful. But hopefully anyone watching or listening to that can see that there's I've never, I never say things for the sake of it. Like I, for me, it ha I'm a very, I'm a hyper rational, hyper logical person. If I'm going to connect with something, it has to be bulletproof mm. or I can't take it on board. It's not useful. I've never had, some people do seem to have the ability to believe something just because they want it to be true. Mm. I don't, I feel like I'm missing that part of me that is sometimes frustrating because I just... I can't just believe something because, because I want it. If it's never been my experience, just yeah. believing something is really hard, but I try to think of things in a very nuanced way. And I wrote this book, Love Life. It's called How to Ra Love Life, How to Raise Your Standards, Find Your Person and Live Happily No Matter What. I wrote this book as a co-pilot for anybody who is being intentional about wanting to find love in their lives. And Anyone who's being intentional about wanting to do love better, mm. wherever, whatever stage you find yourself in, if, if you were heartbroken, this book is going to help you heal from that heartbreak. If you've been single for so long that it feels like a chronic pain in your life, that you, the, the loneliness is chronic, the, the sadness you feel, or the anxiety you feel is chronic, then it's going to meet you in your chronic pain. Mm and help you understand how to address that and how to take yourself out of it to a better place in your life. Mm. Um, if you want to understand what might be holding you back on a deeper level, it's going to help you understand that. So it will meet you where you're at, but the, the who it's for is anyone who wants to find love, wants to become the most confident version of themselves in the process, no matter what season of your life you're in, and wants to be happier even in the meantime, because <laughs> it's like life is too, life is too short mm. to defer your happiness to a time when you've now found the thing that you're looking for. And don't worry again, this isn't, I don't write a chapter on like finding your enlightened, happy place prior to finding the love you want it i the the chapter i write on this it's the final chapter on the book but it's called happy enough mm -hmm. because i find happy especially when you're in a dark place happy is so intimidating mm. and i i suffered i talk about this in the book but i suffered from chronic physical pain for many years that 
really like threatened to ruin my life. I mean, I got to, you and I have talked about this. I got to such a dark, dark place with this physical pain. I had it in my ear, my head. It was a combination of tinnitus ringing in my ears that never went away, but also um, pain, physical pain in my head and my ear. And it got to the point where it was so dark. I said to a therapist, like, I'm, uh, this was why I started therapy. I didn't start therapy because I was trying to optimize in my life. I started therapy because I was in a place where I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm like that depressed and unhappy. I don't know what I'm going to do. And I literally said to him, I'm, uh, I've decided, I've made a decision that I'm just going to live for everyone else now because I'm never going to be, for as long as I have this, I'm never going to be happy again. And I can't seem to make it go away. So where does that leave me? Mm. <laughs> and my own journey, if someone had come along and told me how to be happy in that time, I would have wanted to punch them in the face. Like it would have been so unrelatable to me. The idea of optimization or peak performance or any of that crap in that moment, I would have been like, you, you are speaking a different language than I am just feel like fighting for emotional survival every single day. Mm. And you talking to me about this, like self-development right now is a complete, you're on a different planet. So it made me feel alone in my life and it made me feel like I was kind of on the outside of my life all the time. Just like looking at the the life I was living and going, well, I'm not here for any of this. I would be at family occasions where I'd normally be so happy and I would just, I'd be a zombie in the room. So the reason I say all of that is because it was through being in that really dark place that I learned how to be happy enough mm. to where I, because I couldn't make the pain go away. So I went, I need to, I got to a place where I was happy enough that I felt like I could live a good life, even if it never went away. And that the tools that I learned to do that have become like the tools that I've uh, uh, internalized and think about every day for every part of my life now. And I never would have accessed those tools if I wasn't in that kind of a place. And, and my life is very different now. Like I have a completely different level of peace. So how is the pain? I don't, I still have ringing in my ears uh, and it doesn't bother me at all. There was a mm. time where it would, there was a time where I thought, I don't know how I'm ever going to find joy again with this. Cause it was all I thought about 24 seven. And now it doesn't bother me at all. That is incredible. At all. Like I, I couldn't have even... Five years ago, I could not have had this conversation with you because talking about it would have made me break down. Wow. And, and it doesn't, it does not bother me. I have a completely different relationship with it. And, and which is crazy because at some level, it sounds like nothing has changed except the relationship with the thing. <laughs> that, that's exactly right. Yeah. And, and I also, you know, the pain I had, I looked at a couple of things in my life that were what I realized with the pain was that the pain would get even worse in times where I was really upset or I was really stressed or I was really scared. Or, I'm getting emotional, man. This is like so self-loving. I, I, I feel it. It's really beautiful. Yeah, no, it was like really, it was a, it was a, it was it, weirdly, it was the closest I ever felt to myself. Mm. was when I was in this place of my pain. Yeah. And I would, I would, I realized like, oh, if it gets worse in those times, I need to look at what upsets me in my life. I need to look at what is hurting me. I need to look at what is making me stressed. And I need to, I need to find a way to, like the compassionate thing to do for myself is to start to remove some of these things. Yeah. And I had to, make a couple of very big decisions in my life. Um, very big decisions in my life that I had never had the courage to make before about who and what to remove. Mm. And 
the craziest thing is that it's the physical pain started to ease up when I did that. It was a very, it was a really, really crazy thing. I never would have believed it, but it started to ease up. And again, this isn't a story of how it all went away. I still have ringing in my ears, but I, I don't, A, the physical pain has subsided because I now look back and I realize there was so much going on in my life that was making me activating those physical symptoms that they calm down mm -hmm. when sometimes if I get really upset or stressed, they, I start to feel them coming back. Yeah. And I, I'm calm these days when they come back because I'm like, it's all right. I know I've been here. I know this. Could be with it. I know my yeah. way around this. Like I remember a time. I remember I got to happy enough even with this pain. It's wow. not like I only got to happy enough after it went away. I had by the I had made peace with it never going away. I had completely surrendered, and and then later on, mm -hmm. I was shocked to feel it start to subside. But the the ringing in my ears is still there, and the difference is like now, I have this interesting sort of weird almost like a friendship with it where like i i kind of like it's more like i can be in bed at night and it gets quiet like because the time where i really hear it, I, we have a fan on every night to give me some white noise uh which audrey <laughs> unfortunately bless her has had to get used to this fan every night that we have on <laughs> but it like sometimes we're traveling and the and I don't have like a source yeah. of white noise and and I lay in bed and I and it's like the ringing is there and it's this like sort of old friend where I'm like wow oh come like have a seat here we go like you're there hi like and it's like taught me so much I I, say what a challenging it, and beautiful teacher man unbelievable man I and wow. and, and I had never been I'd so much of the things in my life that I overcame, I could overcome with grit and determination and mm -hmm. working really hard. And this one didn't respond to any of those things. And it became the greatest lesson of my life in so many ways, because it was like, this is, you know, what, how do you respond to this thing that you can't work your way out of? How do you respond to this thing you can't make go away? There's the thing. And what I realized is there's the physical pain. And then there's the emotional component of this that's really high. And it and it was there was a time where it was like this kind of like, what's the word for something that just keeps speeding up? Like, or it keeps, like a centrifugal or centripetal. Yeah. yeah. It, 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 it was like compounding because I was, panic I was truly panicking and I thought my life was over and I told my story self a story my life was over and you know the uh, I, I and then I told myself a story I'd done it to myself yeah and then I hated myself for it and then I, yeah. and like it it just got to the point where my emotion was taking that pain from like a seven to a 10 all the time. And what's crazy is probably that's exactly how you behaved with external pains in your life like in a relationship or something is, you know, when there's a challenge, it's I grit, I fight, doesn't work. Then I beat the hell out of myself and I, yeah. And yeah, this is just exactly like, right. and it's like, we're not going to move until you, this emotional cycle yep. gets reassessed. And, and, and re that, and that it was, it was just truly, it was like a, I'd be a different person today. I'd, if, if I hadn't gone through that, I would be a different person than the one that I am today. I it, It's given me a depth and an ability to connect with other people that I never wow. would have had. And the, there's a, I, I, a, the therapist I was working with, he told me a story of two rats, an experiment where rat A and rat B and rat A was on a wheel that it could run on any time it wanted. And rat B was on a wheel, just like that one that was connected to rat A's wheel. Mm. So anytime rat A ran, rat B had to run. Mm. They were both doing the exact same amount of 
exercise. But rat A showed all of the positive markers of exercise and rat B showed all of the negative markers of stress. Yeah. And what he told me was rat A chose to run and rat B didn't. Rat B had to. And when we're in a place in life where we feel like pain has just been inflicted on us, we feel like we're rat B. Yeah. Trying to get out of it, trying to mitigate it. Trying I to have to do this. There's yeah. no choice. I'm just, ha I'm having to run. Life is making me run. Now, what we forget in that is that we're, we choose to run all the time. When you start a business, you're choosing to run. When you write a book, you're choosing to run. When you go to the gym, you're choosing to run. Mm -hmm. we, we choose pain all the time in life. And when we do, we connect it with these positive benefits that we're trying to get from choosing this pain. I would argue that the pain that, that life has inflicted on me has never given me any less benefit than the pain I've chosen. Hmm. I would, in many cases, I would actually argue I've gotten more out of the pain that I didn't choose than the pain I did choose. So you are rat B in this, in a, to a degree. And well, they're you are still finding... Well, here's the thing. Like, I started to visualize, like, that I was, like, given a menu. Mm -hmm. And that on that menu were the circumstances of my life that were causing me the most pain. And next to each one of those were the unique benefits yeah. that could be got from that item on the menu. Mm -hmm. And... The benefits that could only have been gotten through that item on the menu. And each one had its own treasure that you got. Mm -hmm. And then choosing, like almost retroactively going, well, I do really want that. And there's no other way to get it. Yeah. So, okay, I will choose that from the menu. And there's something about that connection to, to these are the things you get on the menu. These are the benefits. Something about that in my mind, turned me from rat B to rat A. Yeah. Um, so, and it, this, this is kind of one of the, the, the tools that I used in that there's seven or eight in the book, but like that's, these are some of the things that for me, when I was deep in it, transformed the experience for me. So all of that to say, this, this book was, is not just written for people who like, what I, you know what, I want to find love. It was written for people in some of the darkest times of their life where they're like, I don't, I, you know, I feel like I'm deficient. I feel like I'm not good enough. I feel like I'm never going to be good enough. Or I feel like, or you've just had your heart obliterated by somebody and you, you feel like you're never going to be the same again, or you're never going to get over it. Mm -hmm. Or people who are in, you may not be in chronic physical pain, but it has all the same properties as chronic emotional pain. At a certain point, they're one and the same. My chronic physical pain became chronic emotional pain. So the way out of those things is the same. The tools that you use to manage your relationship with pain is the same. Mm -hmm. And that this whole book was written on this idea that there are three relationships that dictate the quality of our life. Our relationship with other people our relationship with ourselves and our relationship with life itself. And those are three relationships from now till the day you die, you'll never be rid of. Mm. So how we feed those relationships and how we manage them, even in the most difficult times, that's going to determine how good of a go we have of, you know, we're here anyway. <laughs> so like, you know, am, am I creating the best experience of this thing? And, and on a deep... On the surface level, this book is designed to be a co-pilot for people who want to find love. On a deeper level, it's designed to help people navigate all three of those relationships, even in the darkest times. And for anyone who wants a copy, we have a, a website, lovelifebook.com, where you can grab one. Um, there's there, It's designed to be for everybody. There'll be chapters. I know that you have a huge number of guys who listen to this show. There'll be chapters in there that, or maybe there's one or two chapters that might feel like they're more geared towards women, but on the whole, 90% of this book you'll find relevant. And the 10% that you don't, you will also find really insightful about women. Mm. So it will be valuable either way. Uh, and I'm also doing an event on May 4th called Find Your Person that is exclusively for everyone who gets a copy of the book. So if you go to lovelifebook.com, 
you can not only get the book, but you can take your receipt and mm. put it in for a, a ticket to that event, which like is going to be an online Zoom event. Yeah, it'll be a virtual right. event for people all over cool. the world. Um, and uh, by the way, that website has uh, links to Amazon and Barnes and Noble and anywhere else. So you can still get it from wherever you want to get it, but you can also come back to that page and get uh, your ticket to the event. Awesome, man. Thank you, dude. Thanks for having me, brother. Wonderful.